Okay, we're back with Thomas Taylor's dissertation, Aristotle's philosophy. The last section was on place, Aristotle's notion of place from the physics, which I remember from uh, reading the physics by itself with no commentary a while ago. It's just like made no sense. I mean, it's kind of, I guess you understand why he was formulating the concept the way he was, but it, it is definitely problematic. So I looked since yesterday at some other kind of modern readings of the Aristotelian uh, notion of place. And the two kind of senses that he gives, the first one is like, it doesn't work with the refined version. And then they're just not really compatible, the two kind of definitions. The first one is, of course, the internal uh, superficies of the containing medium of something. So it's dependent on body. It's not just an abstract interval. And he doesn't want it to be an abstract interval to have this kind of duplication or avoid the duplication of place problem where there will be no particular um, reason to exclude a bunch of places occupying kind of the same place, places within places to infinitum. And, um, but I think his definition that he goes with has sort of can have that problem and has other problems too. So he refines it though by saying it's not just the internal uh, limits of the containing thing because the containing thing itself may move and that shouldn't count as a, a fixed place. So instead it's the first limits of something that is stationary and, and stable but then like precisely what those limits are becomes a little more vague. Like the place of a physical object, you can see how the place of like a uh, pair of scissors that I have on my desk is the limits of the air that surround it. But then once you say that, well, the air specifically is moving, then what is the limit? What is the boundary of the object then? Is it like the walls of my room? because then we eliminate the first definition of place as those limits of the immediately containing medium. So now we can have intermediate things between a thing and the place in which it is. And since, you know, uh, physical things do move, there's going to be, we're going to have to refer to some kind of like cosmological notion ultimately, like the place of everything is within the heavens that could constitute a real place. Um, and so you can see, even with that definition, like we're, we're going to have places within places. Um, we could be within the sublunar circle. We could be within all these other things. A ship on a river, the, the water's moving, so the water doesn't define the place of the ship. But the banks of the river can define the place of the ship. But they don't contain the ship, right? So it's like, is the how exactly is the relation between the ship and the banks of the river drawn, right? Um, so it's a problematic definition and what he gives at first kind of contradicts what he gives later. They're just not totally compatible. I do think that it's, it's Aristotle's fault here that it's, uh, so hard to grasp, but, uh, let's, so we were finishing this section and we were just going to read this last footnote, which hopefully recaps and summarizes a bit of it. So let's come back here. Um, he, if therefore the same thing is matter and energy for water is both but one is in capacity and the other in energy it will subsist in a certain respect as a whole as sorry as a part to the whole hence also in these there is contact but there is a coherence when both become one in energy and concerning place indeed that it is and what it is has been said so that's the end of that section that we read last time let's read the footnote four what is here said is not the solution of a doubt, but is added at the last of the axioms concerning place, viz. that every body naturally tends to and abides in its proper place. Aristotle therefore shows that this is consequent to the definition of place, and at the same time solves a certain objection which occurs. Hence, this also accords with the solution of the doubts, for how, it may be said, will the boundary of water be the place of earth, or the boundary of air the place of water, and so in succession, if it is necessary that place should be allied and similar to that which is in place, on which account also it is said to be appropriate to it. 
But water is dissimilar, different from, and contrary to earth, and air to water, in consequence of changing into each other. Aristotle therefore says that bodies which are next in order to each other and touch each other without violence are mutually allied and appropriate, air indeed to fire, for it has heat in common and compact with it, and on this account the mutation from air to fire is easy. But water is allied to air, for moisture is common to both. In like manner, also, earth is allied to water, for they have the cold in common. Earth, however, is not allied to air, nor water to fire. Fire, also, though it has its beginning in generation and mutation, yet, uh, so he's referring here to the idea that, like, there are two qualities, uh, so it, you get, like, a four-part square that produces the elements so like i think water is obviously wet and cold and so it's dry wet hot cold so earth i think is dry and cold uh water is wet and cold air is dry no it's dry and hot and then fire is no, fire must be dry and hot. Air is wet and hot, I suppose. So anyway, you can uh, produce the elements out of this combinations of things. And then he explains the kind of mutual sympathy of the elements. How this relates to place exactly is not clear to me. Earth, however, is not allied to air nor water to fire. Fire also, though it has its beginning in generation and mutation, yet as in things of this kind is the most appropriate of all things to the lunar sphere and to that part of it which approximates to generation or the sublunary region for fire is luminous and immaterial and has the relation of form to the other elements so it's immaterial relatively speaking each therefore tending to its own kindred body tends to its proper place <clears throat> okay so the proper place because the elements are stacked, so earth in the center, and then, I guess, water, and then air, and then fire. Um, so the proper place of the elements is determined by their mutual sympathies, and each goes to its proper place, the place being the limits of the surrounding bodies. So, the, like, the idea that water should have a proper place is compatible with the definition of place that Aristotle arrives at, but it's not entailed by it by any means, as the footnotes seem to claim. Each, therefore, tending to its kindred body, tends to its proper place. But Aristotle very properly says, not only in a consequent order, but touching. For things are successive or in a consequent order, when there is nothing of a similar kind between, as houses are said to be in a consequent order to each other when there is no other house between them. But things which are thus successive neither touch each other, nor is the one, as it were, in the place of the other. Yeah, and this, uh, again, raises that issue where he defined place by contact, by contiguity before, but then the latter definition, the first limit, which is immovable, is not compatible with that. Because he said that, like, an object in a ship where the ship is moving is in a vessel rather than in a place. The ship is not the place of the object in the ship, but it's the vessel of it. The place would be, I guess, the riverbanks, but then that's not touching. And then, so that idea that there has to be contiguity for there to be the relation of place to an object is kind of thrown out. That's how it seems to me. Because... He, yeah, even here it says contact, therefore, is necessary that it may be place. But that doesn't make sense if you say it's the first limit which is immovable. Right? Because you can be in contact with something that is movable, and then that doesn't count as a place. And the, But everything that exists is in a place. Aristotle says in the very beginning of that section on the concept of place... So I think just everything that Aristotle says does not concord with each other. Like it doesn't all make sense together. Contact can't be necessary if we can say that it's the first immovable boundary. Like you could say there's a chain of contact from that immovable boundary down to the object that you're talking of specifically. But 
Aristotle doesn't give any qualifier like that. He also necessarily adds, not by violence, for some things may touch each other, not naturally, but violently, and such as these are not of a kindred nature. If, therefore, kindred bodies, having a natural order with respect to each other, desire to be successive and to touch each other without violence, these, when divulsed, will hasten to abide, or rather, hasten to and abide in each other as their proper place. But since the parts are allied to each other, so, I mean, you can see how then, I guess, that contiguity is involved in the notion of nonviolent contact, um, of, or, yeah, the, the nonviolent contact or contiguity of elements does explain the idea of proper places and that objects have a kind of goal to be somewhere in particular. The definition is related, but it, I still don't think... Um, that the relation of the elements follows from the definition of place. But. but since the parts are allied to each other and to the whole, yet are not in each other as in place, or as in the whole place, he assigns the cause of this. For things which are conascent and continuous with each other are impassive by each other, since it is necessary that which acts should be one thing and that which is passive another. But things continued and conascent are one, and things which are not impassive, but act and suffer, these are not continued, nor so allied as things which touch. For here the agent is one thing, and the patient another, but they approach and are allied, uh, allied to each other. They are not, however, so allied as parts which are from the same elements, but they have something common and something different, and on this account they change into each other. These, therefore, are things which are in place, for bodies which, when placed near to and touching each other, act and suffer, these are naturally moved and tend, as he says, as the imperfect to the perfect. And the footnote keeps going. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But Aristotle, having said that the alliance of body is the cause of its tending to its proper place, he also says that the same thing is the cause of its abiding in its proper place. For as that which is separated from its kindred nature is consequent, um, in consequence of desiring it, is moved towards it, so likewise when it has arrived where it is, it desires to remain there. For it is nearly a part of it, by which it is comprehended according to nature. But it is nearly a part, because it is not con a continued, but a divided part. So it touches, it's not, yeah, it's contiguous, not continuous. But it's nearly continuous because of the sympathy of the elements with each other as described uh, above. As therefore it is natural to parts both to tend to their holes and abide in them, so likewise it is natural to things that are allied when they are divided to tend to and abide in each other as in their proper place for as parts properly so called as for instance a part of water or air preserves in its whole an adaptation to it both when the whole is moved and when it is permanent in like manner things which are allied according to another mode preserve an appropriate subsistence as for instance water to air but Aristotle supposes the part to be moved, that he may the more assimilate it to things in place. For water seems to be, in a certain respect, a portion separated from air, yet it is not a part or portion in the same manner as matter, from which a composite is produced, characterized by form. For air is produced from water as from matter, in the same manner as a statue from brass, or rather, as an animal from seed, since the water does not remain when the air is produced." But how does Aristotle say, quote, Thus also is air to water, for this is as matter, but that as form. Water indeed is the matter of air, but air is, as it were, a certain energy of water. Though at the same time, he says, water is a part of air, for matter is not a part of form, but both are parts of the composite. In answer to this, it may be said that the composite is especially essentialized and characterized according to form. Or, as Aristotle says, that water is air in capacity, for as seed appears to be a part of the animal produced from it, so water is, in a certain respect, a part of the air generated from it, being air in capacity. So seed is part of the animal, but is also, as it were, the matter. 
out of which it's derived. But anyway, I'm not going to work too hard on all of this. He Aristotle said he would get to that discussion, which he raises, I think, seemingly for no good reason other than to indicate that the position, the natural positions of the elements are related to this definition of place. But he brings it up and says, but we're going to deal with that later. So we also will deal with it later. Chapter 11. Of a perfect vacuum, which has no existence except in the heads of those who think it has, Aristotle writes as follows. Quote Aristotle on the vacuum. After the same manner, we must conceive that it is the business of a natural philosopher to speculate concerning a vacuum, whether it is or not, and how it subsists, or what it is, just as concerning place, for it is attended with similar incredibility, and the belief in it is derived from the conceptions about it. For those who assert that there is a vacuum, consider it as if it were a certain place and vessel. And it appears so... The discussion of place precedes it because one of the common misconceptions about place as interval leads to the idea of the vacuum. But Aristotle's definition of place avoids the seeming necessity of the vacuum. And it appears indeed to be full when it possesses the bulk which it is capable of receiving. But when it is deprived of this, it is void, as if a vacuum, plenum, and place were the same but their essence not the same. It is necessary, however, to begin the speculation, assuming the assertions of those who say that there is a vacuum, and again of those who deny its existence. So let's hear those who argue on each side. And in the third place, we must consider common opinions concerning them. Those, therefore, who endeavor to show that there is not a vacuum do not refute that which men wish to call a vacuum, but that which they erroneously assert, as Anaxagoras and others, who confute about this manner. For they demonstrate that air is something by twisting bladders, showing how strong the air is, and receive it in clepsidrae. Uh, footnote 5, the clepsidrae, uh, says Simplicius, i.e. harpage were instruments for drawing up vessels of water from wells. These instruments, when they contained air, did not receive water, but immediately on the departure of the air seized the water, which they did not dismiss, till the person who covered the cavity with his finger removed it, and thus permitting the air to enter in proportion to the water that ran out. Um, so Aristotle is saying here, um, they don't... The men who want to show there's no vacuum don't refute that which men wish to call a vacuum, but that which they erroneously assert, who confute after this manner. So I'm just trying to track this sentence here. Um, they erroneously assert what they call a vacuum, this phenomena uh, related to the vacuum so I'm actually going to just keep reading and hopefully you know it'll be clarified but men conceive that a vacuum is an interval in which there is no sensible body and fancying that all being is body they say that vacuum sorry they say that is a vacuum in which in short there is nothing and on this account that what is full of air is a vacuum um, so he's saying that some people who argue against the vacuum argue erroneously from the existence of air, and that's a mistake. Okay. Hence, it is not necessary to demonstrate that air is something, but that there is not an interval different from and separate from bodies. So that's the real thing that needs to, to be argued. Not that air is a real thing, but that interval is not um, separate from bodies. So there's no abstract background grid of space that things move on, because then the vacuum could exist, but instead we have to eliminate the interval in that sense. And that it is not in energy, um, and think back to the concept of matter, we called it interval and quantum, but it is related to bodies. And that was the first notion of space, right? The pure interval 
was prior to the great and small, but it's a movement from being to non-being. It's like the first appearance of body. Um, and that's also the first appearance of, you know, location and spatial properties. So spatial properties from the ground up, from the existence of, uh, existence of matter, already assume bodies. And here, given the no notion of uh, place, interval is not going to be separate from bodies either. That is like large scale spatial interval. And that it is not, let me restart here. Um, actually all the way back here. Hence, it is not necessary to demonstrate that air is something, but that there is not an interval different from inseparable from bodies, and that it is not in energy and does not pervade through every body, so that it is not continuous, as Democritus and Leucippus say, who maintain the existence of the void, and many other physiologists, and that it is not anything beyond all body, since body is continuous. So there is a plenum, he's saying, contrary to the atomists who maintained that there is this void. Footnote six. Of this opinion also, says Simplicius, were Metrodorus, the Chian, and some of the Pythagoreans, as Aristotle also shortly after informs us. This likewise was the opinion of Epicurus. Simplicius adds that Porphyry does not write, oh, mm, I'm not gonna read all that, neither being separate nor in energy, but neither inseparable nor separable from them. Uh, for Democritus, says Porphyry, asserted that this interval is inseparable from bodies, on which account neither is the universe continued, bodies being intercepted by a vacuum, but those, as the Pythagoreans, said it is separable, who asserted that there is a vacuum beyond the world, but admitted the universe to be continued. Okay, so some Pythagoreans held that there's a vacuum outside of the cosmos, but that the cosmos is a plenum. However, as Simplicius justly observes, the former reading is better though the latter may also be defended. For of those who believed in a vacuum, some said it was itself separate by itself, pervading through the whole world and extending in continuity beyond the world. But others said that it is everywhere dispersed through the pores of bodies and on this account appears to be inseparable from them. Hence of the four following arguments, that from motion and increase introduces the first vacuum, but that from compression and ashes, the second. So that those who wish to oppose a vacuum by showing that air is something do not proceed to this conception or a vacuum through the proper gates, according to the proverb, and as it were entrances, but beside the gates, that is externally and through other avenues. But those speak more probably who say that there is a vacuum. Um, but Aristotle's going to reject the vacuum. But Oh, uh they speak more probably than those who try to say that air is something. So I think it's just rearticulating that at the end here, um, some people argue for the existence or the non-existence of a vacuum by showing that air is something that's dumb. And those argue more probably or make a plausible case that there is a vacuum, although still that's wrong. Um, okay, so let's go back up here. Uh, these, therefore, do not meet the problem through the gate, but rather those who say that there is a vacuum. Okay, so people who talk about that air is a real thing are just missing the point. They're not going at it in the right way. Those like Democritus and, uh, Democritus and Leucippus who say that there is a vacuum or at least like in the right playing field. But one thing indeed, which they say is that uh, is this, that if there is not a vacuum, there will not be local motion. And this is lation and increase. For motion would not appear to subsist unless there was a vacuum, since that which is full cannot receive. So he's giving the argument of the atomists for the existence of the vacuum. And if it could receive, there would be two bodies in the same thing. Certainly on this hypothesis, any number of bodies, whatever, may subsist together for the difference cannot be adduced through which that which is asserted will not take place. Um, but, so he's saying 
I think that those who argue in this way don't say why any number of bodies can't be in superposition. Uh, and then I think he's going to give that argument. But if this be possible, the smallest may receive the greatest thing. For that which is great is many small things. So that if many equal things may be in the same thing, this also may be the case with many unequal things. Melissus, therefore, shows from these things that the universe is immovable, for if it were moved... So yeah, Melissus will argue against the vacuum too, uh, but he takes the arguments of the atomists for the void and says, well, the issue is that there's no motion. You say that without a vacuum, motion wouldn't be possible. Well, there's no motion, so no problem. Melissus, therefore, shows from these things that the universe is immovable, for if it were moved, it would be necessary, says he, that there should be a vacuum. But a vacuum does not rank among beings. In one way, therefore, they thus show that there is a certain void. That's, so that's one of their arguments for the void. Footnote 7. Aristotle adduces four arguments of those who say there is a vacuum. One, according to the conception of a separate vacuum. Three, according to the conception of a vacuum dispersed through the pores of bodies. He adds also a fifth argument from the opinion of the Pythagoreans. But of the four arguments, the first is as follows. Arising from a certain division of one asserting that local motion, which is beheld in lation and in augmentation, is either produced through an intermediate vacuum or through a plenum. But it is impossible that it can be produced through a plenum, as will be shown. It must therefore be produced through a vacuum, and consequently there is a vacuum. And indeed, that motion must necessarily be produced through something intermediate appears to be self-credible to the intelligent, because the local transition from this thing to that, that from which, and that to which, differing from each other, must be affected through some interval between the two. But that every interval must necessarily be either full or not full is evident, for the division is contradictory. But that which is not a plenum is entirely a vacuum. That it is, however, impossible for motion to be produced through a plenum, he demonstrates through a hypothetical syllogism as follows. If the motion of bodies, according to place, is through a plenum, body will penetrate body, and the smallest will receive the greatest. But this is impossible, since, if admitted, the water in a bowl might receive the sea. The antecedent, therefore, is impossible, viz. that motion should be effected through a plenum. He also shows the deduction, i.e., I think that Aristotle eventually will say that there is no vacuum, though. So... He also shows the deduction, i.e. that the smallest would receive the greatest through this, that if, in short, it received any other body from the first, so as that there could be two bodies in the same interval, the same also would receive another third, because it had received the double, and the whole again would receive another fourth, and so on in succession, for no reason can be assigned why it should receive one and not many bodies, for one was full as also two. It will therefore receive the greatest, for since it is great, it may be divided into many parts equal to that small thing which was the subject at first. For that which is great, as Aristotle says, is many small things. So the smallest, if it can be in superposition of many bodies occupying the same interval, will become the greatest, because the great is many small things. And each of the small things in that which is great, being equal to the small subject which was at first, the whole also will subsist in it, and the smallest will receive the greatest, which is obviously absurd. It is evident also that if it should receive things equal, it will likewise receive things unequal to itself, for many equal things make the unequal. It receives, therefore, things unequal. Right, so if it receives many equal things, then the sum of those equal things are unequal to it, so it receives the unequal. It receives, therefore, things unequal and consequently the greatest, though for it to receive things unequal is absurd, and hence Aristotle does not om uh, omit to mention this absurdity. But that the introduction of a vacuum from motion is ancient is credible from Melissus, using the deduction as evident that if any being is moved, it is moved through a vacuum, and afterwards assuming this position, but there is not a vacuum, he adds, being therefore is not moved. Melissus, how, however, did not reason in this manner concerning a corporeal nature, nor concerning anything partial, but about that which is intelligible in every way perfect, 
for he conceived that this is one and immovable, demonstrating its immobility through its being all things, and through there being nothing besides it, which can occasion it to be moved from the condition of being it possesses through a vacuum, for there is no vacuum there. Perhaps, too, neither is there any difference there, since it is all things, and non-being has no place in all perfect being. And though it should be admitted that difference is there, according to which forms are separated from each other, yet difference also is being. And a vacuum has no place in all perfect being, as neither has non-being. Quote, let not your intellect this path explore. Uh, yeah, so don't even look into non-being, says Parmenides in his poem. Um... Is there more footnote? No. And this one started up here. In another way, therefore, they thus show that there is a certain void. But in another way, because some things appear to come together and to be compressed, just as they say that wine is received by tubs together with bladders as if the condensed body would enter into the inherent void spaces. So yeah, how are things compressed if there's no void space in the thing that can receive the compressed matter? The, uh, footnote eight, the second argument by which a vacuum is attempted to be proved is taken from the following experiment. Let there be a tub full of wine. Let the wine afterwards be poured out into bladders. The tub will now receive the same wine together with the bladders, but it was full with the wine alone. How, therefore, will a place be given for the bladders, unless we say there are certain void spaces in the wine, into which a part of the wine recedes and which it fills, and that thus the wine is compressed and condensed? Hence it comes to pass that place is left for the bladder. All right. Um, so that's the argument there have, uh, has to be a space for compression to occur again increase likewise appears to all men to be affected through a vacuum it's not just con condensation but increase for nutriment is a body and it is impossible for two bodies to subsist together um, they also adduce as an evidence that which happens about ashes, which receives as much water as a void vessel. The argument from nutriment is a little confusing. Like, why, why does that show that there is a vacuum? Kind of strange. I don't get that at all. We'll go to footnote 9 about the ashes, which I think is a separate argument. But let's see if the footnote helps. The fourth argument is assumed from another experiment by which it appears that a vessel will receive as much water when it is full of ashes as when it is empty, which it would seem cannot happen for any other reason than because the ashes have many void spaces which receive the water or receive the ashes when they are compressed. Yeah, so he doesn't address this argument that was confusing to me from nutriment. If, if uh, anyone, the one viewer in here on YouTube has a solution to this uh, issue of nutriment, why does taking in nutriment show a vacuum? Share that thought. I don't know if uh, Karnik and the Jitsi, you have a suggestion. Uh, I'm happy to just kind of leave that aside for now, but... All right, the Pythagoreans also say that there is a vacuum. And the footnote said some of the Pythagoreans, but okay, Aristotle says, that's important to remember, that uh, Pythagoreans maintained that, and that it enters into the heaven as if the heaven respired from an infinite spirit. So yeah, some Pythagoreans maintained there was a vacuum outside of the cosmos as a whole. They likewise assert that a vacuum is that which distinguishes natures, as if a vacuum were a certain separation and distinction of things in a consequent order, and that this first subsists in numbers, since a, va a vacuum gives distinction to their nature. So the idea of some Pythagoreans is that a vacuum is that which separates even numbers from each other, so you need some kind of separating boundary and the vacuum provides that but maybe they meant that metaphorically 
Um, interesting. Let's see what the footnote says. Uh, so what else, says Simplicius, can be the meaning of these enigmas of the Pythagoreans than this? That the difference, which is above the corporeal world and gives separation to the forms that are there, being participated by the sensible world, produces the distinction and separation of the forms it contains, there being no vacuum in the incorporeal world. So yeah, it's metaphorical, as I kind of indicated. Difference is a form. And that difference gives separation to forms um, in the sensible world, and we can call that vacuum, I guess. Thus, the beautiful is different from the just, not because it is not just, but because it is all things according to the beautiful, through the union which is there, and because non-being is not in that which is perfectly being. So there, the forms are not separated from each other by a, a literal vacuum or non-being. They, they are distinguished from each other by their own essence expressing itself. Although they contain all things, they contain all things in the manner of their own peculiar essence. So, in but in the sensible region, separation is produced through the introduction of non-being. For the monad... Um, and remember from the sophist, non-being is associated with the different. It's not an absolute non-being. So difference in the realm of the forms where there is no vacuum gives the appearance of forms, or sorry, gives the appearance of vacuum in the sensible world. Uh, vacuum being a kind of corporeal notion of non-being. Let's read this sentence again. But in the sensible region, separation is produced through the introduction of non-being, for the monad is not the dyad, and the dyad is not the monad. And non-being, which subsists between these, so yeah, that's just how he talks about it in the sophist, the non-being is a not being some other particular thing. It's not an absolute. So non-being is kind of difference. Non-being, which subsists between these, is the vacuum which separates the forms in the world. So we call it vacuum when really it's just the relative absence of a property. So the monad is vacuous of the dyad and the dyad is vacuous of the monad in some sense by not being each other. Just as difference in the incorporeal world, which is itself being and is not called non-being, and therefore is not a vacuum, separates the supermundane forms. So yeah, non-being is associated, that's important to remember when we look back at the sophist eventually, that in the intelligible world, difference is not the same as non-being. But in the sensible world, the way difference manifests is a kind of relative non-being. The difference, however, which is there, is the cause of the void which is here. And on this account, Plato, in the Sophist, calls it, in a certain respect, non-being. Simplicius adds that Straton of Lampsacon reduces these four arguments to two, viz. to motion according to place and to the composition of bodies, but that he adds a third argument from attraction. For it happens, says he, that the magnet draws some pieces of iron through others, because the stone attracts through the pores of the iron. And the, oh, interesting. So the magnetic field passes through the iron, right? Because you can have a chain of iron things. There's something in between the original magnet and the thing being attracted. So the attractive force has to pass through the other bodies. And if they were totally plenum, then how could anything, the magnetic attraction, pass through them? Um, and the iron is at the same time drawn together with the body which it attracts. And this piece of iron again attracts another, which is next it, and that another. This series, too, of pieces of iron is suspended from the stone. So the force passes through iron, so the iron has void in it. That's uh, Straton's ar third argument. Uh, let's, just for the sake of it, look up Straton of Lampsicus. Lampsicus is what comes up. 
He was a peripatetic philosopher, 335 through 269 BC, so an early Aristotelian, and the third director of the Lyceum after the death of uh, Theophrastus. Okay, so Aristotle and then Theophrastus uh, and then Strato. He uh, devoted himself especially to the study of natural science and increased the naturalistic element in Aristotle's thought to such an extent that he denied the need for an act of God to construct the universe, preferring to place the government of the universe in the unconscious force of nature alone. So a uh, naturalizing tendency in Aristotelianism set in even by the third scholar of the Lyceum, Straton, and here's one of his arguments. So, cool. Come back up here. Um, okay, since a vacuum gives distinction to their nature. So again, uh, Simplicius's interpretation of that is that the Pythagoreans said that there's a vacuum here by analogy and it, what they're really talking about is the non-being as we see it in Plato's sophist so many therefore and such and we see Aristotle like act totally dense when it comes to metaphorical expressions by Plato and by Pythagoreans and other places where he's like it's absurd to say that the soul is a number for these reasons and of course the Pythagoreans didn't mean that the soul is literally a number but Aristotle just doesn't, I don't know, whether he's like trying to cloak. I've thought this possibility before, that maybe Aristotle was, you know, being more a Platonist than he let on, also more a Pythagorean, and he wanted to distinguish himself and hide the true source of his doctrines by mocking them at the surface level. But maybe really he did understand uh, what the Pythagoreans were getting at. That would be Simplicius's line. Probably. Um, you know, Simplicius argues that Aristotle tried to hide his true philosophy um, as all ancient philosophers would. Uh, some used metaphors, some used, you know, uh, like Aristotle, very dense and convoluted arguments. But, uh, and that stems from the prohibitions on revealing the mystery school doctrines. And all of the ancients took many of their doctrines from the mysteries and so that created a necessity in Greek philosophy to always be kind of occult have its exoteric face and then the esoteric meaning that you would have to dig for so maybe that's what's going on why does Aristotle mock the Pythagoreans because he was a secret Pythagorean but maybe not so many therefore and such are nearly the arguments from which some assert and others deny the existence of a vacuum uh, we'll keep going with Aristotle here. In order, however, to understand which of the assertions are true, it is necessary to consider what the name signifies. A vacuum, therefore, appears to be a place in which there is nothing. But the cause of this is that they fancied being to be a body, but every body is in place, and in the place in which there is no body, there is a vacuum. So that if anywhere there is no body, then uh, there, there is a vacuum. Again, they fancy that every body is tangible and that whatever has gravity or levity is a thing of this kind. From syllogism, therefore, it happens that a vacuum is that in which there is nothing heavy or light. These things, therefore, as we have also before observed, are syllogistically inferred. But it is absurd that a point should be a vacuum for it is necessary that a vacuum should be a place in which there is an interval of tangible body. If uh, a vacuum, however, appears in one way to be called that which is not full of a sensible tangible body, and that which possesses gravity and levity is sensible according to touch, hence someone may doubt if interval had color or sound whether it would be a vacuum or not. Or, yeah, so if it doesn't have... Uh, tangibility but does have color or sound could we still should we still call it a vacuum or is it not manifest that if it could receive a tangible body it would be a vacuum but if not that it would not be a vacuum okay so something that could receive a tangible body but doesn't have one would be a vacuum but if it couldn't do that then it wouldn't 
but after another manner, a vacuum is said to be that in which there is not this particular thing, nor any corporeal essence. Hence, some say that a vacuum is the matter of bodies, who also say, though not rightly, that this very thing is place. For matter is not separate from bodies, but they investigate a vacuum as that which is separate. Um... All right, and we go to another chapter, for some reason, um, continuing the same Aristotle quote. And before we go further, let me just like kind of Google, because I'm pretty sure that Aristotle denies the existence of a vacuum. Uh, believe in a vacuum. Yeah, uh, Aristotle argued that a vacuum could not exist as speeds would become infinite. So we'll see that argument, hopefully. Yeah, so we are, uh, we've are we seen the arguments for the vacuum. Aristotle has summarized them. Uh, Thomas Taylor probably could have left this out, in my opinion, um, but all right. And how long does this quote go on? Um, this whole chapter is not very long, so let's just read this chapter. Okay, continuing with Aristotle. Since, therefore, we have sufficiently discussed the nature of place, and it is necessary that a vacuum, if it has a subsistence, should be place deprived of body, and we have, uh, and we have shown how place subsists and how it does not subsist. This being the case, it is evident that a vacuum does not thus subsist. Neither considered, uh, neither considered as separate, nor as inseparable, for a vacuum cannot be a body, but an interval of body. On this account, a vacuum appears to be something, because place also appears to be so, and through the same causes, for those also direct their attention to motion according to place, who say that a vacuum, um, and a vacuum, wait, <laughs> according to place, who say that place and a vacuum are something beside the bodies that fall into them. So Aristotle just refers to his argument against the place being an interval, essentially, and says because place is defined according to body, the whole difficulty never arises or shouldn't. But let's see if, how he addresses the specific arguments. Um, but they fancy that a vacuum is the cause of motion in the same manner as that in which a thing is moved, and this resembles what some assert of place. There is not, however, any necessity that if there is motion there should be a vacuum. And in short, a vacuum can by no means be the cause of every motion, for that reason which was concealed from Melissus. For a plenum may be changed according to quality, so the argument uh, to viz a thing may become hot or cold without any change of place and that is a motion it's not locomotion but a plenum can change qualities can undergo change but neither is it necessary that there should be motion according to place on account of a vacuum for bodies which are moved may yield to each other when there is no separate interval beside them and this also is manifest in the revolutions of things continuous. It's like a fish swimming through water. It moves and the water yields to the fish, even though there's no separate interval between them. And this also is manifest in the revolutions of things continuous, as likewise in the revolutions of human natures. Three, thus, for instance, the first body may pass into the place of the second because the second yields. The second also may pass into the place of the third, the third into the place of the fourth, and the fourth into the place of the first. So rotation, everything can just change places and kind of circulate. Aristotle perspicuously, uh, rather perspicuously, demonstrates that this may be affected from things which are moved in a circle, whether they are continued as a wheel or liquid as water, which is rolled round in a vessel. For in these instances, all the parts are moved and all change their place, yet they do not occupy any space which before was void, but mutually yield to each other. Bodies, too, may be condensed, not into a vacuum, but because the things inherent are expelled. Thus, water being compressed, the inherent air is expelled. 
things likewise may be increased not only from the ingress of some body, but also by a change in quality, as if air should be generated from water. And in short, the reason concerning increase and that of water poured upon ashes, <clears throat> so he's addressing those specific arguments now, excuse me, <clears throat> now, and in short, the reason concerning increase, um, footnote four, the ashes example, if anyone, says Simplicius, indefinitely understands uh, increase of things which arrive to a greater magnitude, it will be sufficient to adduce to him the mutation of water into air, and in short, of a body less to one greater in bulk. But if he understands it of the increase which properly subsists through the intermission of food, he will not, by introducing a vacuum through the accession of food, be any longer subserved, uh, or rather subverted by other arguments, but will be caught, according to the proverb, by his own wings. Or, as Aristotle more properly says, the argument will impede itself. For in order that he may solve the common doubt about nutriment, he introduces a vacuum, at the same time not solving, but rendering the doubt more dubious. For either accretion is produced in consequence of the nutriment pervading through a vacuum, or the nutriment does not pass through the body. And if this be the case, of what use will the hypothesis of a vacuum be? If body does not proceed through body, that which nourishes through that which is nourished. Or what will be the use of a vacuum if nutriment is a body, or if every part is not nourished and increased, which is contrary to evidence, for bodies are nourished and increased every day, or rather, in every part. For if bodies are entirely nourished and increased, every body will pervade through body, to avoid which they suppose a vacuum, suppose a vacuum, or every body will be a vacuum, if every body is indeed increased, but the increase is produced through a vacuum, so that body will no longer have a vacuum in itself, but will itself be a vacuum. Um, and body in a vacuum will be the same thing. Hence those who suppose a vacuum do not show that it has a subsistence, but endeavor to solve the common doubt concerning nutriment through a vacuum, and thus make the doubt still more dubious. So I'm not going to try to follow the details of that. That's the issue of the nutriment argument, which didn't make sense in the first place, but we'll go on. Hopefully he looks at the ashes example next. These doubts concerning nutriment, Aristotle solves in his treatise on generation and corruption, when he says that not every part of the nutriment accedes to the body, but one part of it is carried off insensibly and another is introduced, and that when the influx is greater than the efflux, then increase is produced just as when the efflux is greater than the influx, decrease is produced, for nutriment subsists in the pores of the body, and when it is assimilated, adheres to them. The whole body, however, is not a pore, but where a pore is now, there a plenum is produced, and that which is now a plenum, through effluxion, becomes a pore. But the fourth argument was that which introduced a vacuum from ashes, since a vessel full of ashes receives as much water poured on the ashes as it would receive when empty. For they say they... Either body pervades through body, which is absurd, or the water proceeds into the void spaces of the ashes. By these, therefore, says Aristotle, the doubt is also impeded. For, according, uh, for avoiding the absurdity of body penetrating body, they are compelled to say that ashes are incorporeal and void throughout, uh, in order that the vessel may receive the same quantity of water, as if it did not contain the ashes. Right. Uh, supposing that the ashes have voids in them doesn't address why it could contain the same amount of water because then the ashes would have to be entirely void for if the ashes being body could receive an equal quantity of water it would thus follow that body would pervade through body to avoid which they suppose a vacuum hence these also endeavoring to solve the doubt by a vacuum are impeded by it in the solution of the doubt Eudemus, however, solves the doubt of the ashes in the third book of his physics, for he says that this may happen without void spaces, since something hot appears to be contained in the ashes, just as in a culx. But this is evident from hence, that when the water is poured in, both these burn, the culx indeed itself, but the ashes heat the water which pervades through them. And when this happens, much vapor is exhaled, exhaled so that the masses are diminished through the vapor, Though they are diminished, however, the whole subsistence, or rather substance of the ashes, is not consumed. Simplicius adds, It is possible, therefore, to give assistance both to those who suppose a vacuum and those who introduce condensation, 
by saying that not only the void spaces of the ashes solve the thing investigated, but also that those of the water subside, being impelled by the plenitude of the ashes, so as that they have not the same bulk with the water poured by itself on the ashes. This, then, is what Aristotle says in opposition to the arguments which, according to his narration, introduce a vacuum. But Straton, also solving the argument which is derived from attraction, says that neither does attraction compel us to admit a vacuum. For, in short, it is not evident whether there is such a thing as attraction, since Plato himself appears to subvert an attractive power. Nor, if there is such a thing, is it evident whether the magnet draws through a vacuum and not through some other cause? For those who speak thus do not demonstrate but suppose a vacuum. Okay, so the response to that strato argument is, or sorry, uh, yeah, it is Straton's argument, like as a devil's advocate argument for those who do suppose a vacuum, but Straton strikes it down by saying, and yet we don't know that vacuums operate through, sorry, magnets operate through a vacuum, and we don't even know whether the magnetic attraction actually exists. How did Plato address that and where? I'm not sure. So back up here. Um, and in short, the reason concerning increase and that of water poured upon ashes are respectively impediments to themselves. For either anything whatever is not increased, or it is not increased by body, or two bodies may be in the same place, they think fit therefore to solve the common doubt, but they do not demonstrate that there is a vacuum, or it is necessary that all bodies should be a vacuum, if it is every way increased, and is increased through a vacuum. The same reasoning also applies to ashes, that the arguments therefore from which they show that there is a vacuum may be easily solved is evident. Okay, so specific arguments have been addressed. Uh, we're moving on to the next chapter. We're still in this Aristotle quote. We'll still be looking at the notion of a vacuum and proving why there should not be such a thing. So we'll pick up on this, perhaps during the week, perhaps next Saturday. But thanks everybody.